Hey guys, I'm back. Just a reminder to have a look at that thing that we're doing in South Africa and donate if you can. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then Ben will tell you at the end of the video. <laughs> Starting off the news this week, I'd like to quickly mention the successful test of SpaceX's SN15 prototype of their Starship rocket. I've talked a lot about Starship in the past here, so I won't go into detail about the project itself. Last Wednesday though, came the test of the latest prototype of Starship, named SN15. This has seemingly been the most successful test yet, with the prototype straightening itself and landing back where it took off from, this time without blowing up. Great news for SpaceX, especially given the recent confirmation that a similar craft will be used by NASA to land astronauts on the moon in the near future. In other news, we continue a story that we talked about all the way back in October of last year, NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission to bring a bit of the asteroid Bennu back to Earth. The mission launched back in September of 2016, and has just begun the rather long journey home to arrive back on Earth in September of 2023, after an earlier scare where the craft was unable to close the door containing some of the asteroid sample. Luckily this problem was fixed, and bits of Bennu the asteroid, up to 4.5 billion years old, are on their way home. Also this week has been the naming of a new species of Mosasaur, called Pluridens serpentis. Coming from the very end of the Cretaceous and found in rocks in Morocco, this was an interesting animal with an apparently very specialised lifestyle. The small orbits suggest that this mosasaur would rely mostly on touch and chemoreception while looking for food, instead of relying on eyesight, similar to what marine snakes do, and the relatively small teeth for its large size suggest that it fed on quite small prey. Additionally, since the lower jaws become quite robust and the largest individuals known, it's suggested that this might be an example of sexual dimorphism, with the paleontologists hypothesising that they were even used in combat, like seen in beaked whales and lizards. Pluridens serpentis adds to the increasing richness of mosasaurs known from the end of the Cretaceous, further showing how these animals greatly diversified right up until the mass extinction that killed them off. And now over to Ben, with a visual surprise. Thanks, Doug. Well, in addition to the Mosasaur news, there's also been a lot of exciting dinosaur news this week. First off is a very interesting paper that has investigated the evolution of vision and hearing in theropods, which has made the fascinating discovery that the bizarre little Shivuia from Mongolia was a nocturnal predator. By examining a structure of the inner ear in dinosaurs called the Lagina, the researchers were able to compare how good the hearing of different extinct dinosaurs was compared to modern ones and by looking at the size of the bony ring in the eye called the sclerotic ring, they could tell how much light it was able to let in. The findings demonstrated that most non-bird dinosaurs investigated were daylight animals, with the majority of predatory dinosaurs having relatively good hearing compared with modern birds, while most herbivorous ones had quite poor hearing. But Shuvuia in particular appears to have been highly specialised for hunting at night in its desert habitat, with hearing that rivals that of even the barn owl. So, a fascinating study that reveals all kinds of new possibilities for investigating extinct animal behaviour, and sheds light on one of the strangest dinosaurs of all. Next up is a newly described Ceratopsian, which is always nice. Named Menephiceratops ciliae, it comes from the Upper Cretaceous Menephi Formation in New Mexico, and the material it's based on has actually been described before, but this study re-evaluates the specimen as a new genus and species based on new information since discovered about these animals. Interestingly, it turns out that this may be the oldest known member of the Centrosaurine group, being placed at the base of the clade. This also indicates that the Centrosaurines likely originated in the southern parts of western North America before spreading northwards during later parts of the Cretaceous, a very interesting look at the early evolution of these incredible dinosaurs. And finally, very briefly, is a new genus and species of Parasaurolophine hadrosaur named Talatolophus glorum. Found in late Cretaceous rocks in northern Mexico, this is a pretty complete fossil specimen, and has an interestingly shaped head crest that the researchers noted looks like an Aztec glyph for the word, word. Classified as a basal parasaurolophine, this is a very nice discovery indeed, and further adds to the known diversity of these hadrosaurs. And just before I hand you back to Doug, as you've hopefully seen by now, we're involved in a brilliant project called Threnax an initiative run by paleontologists at the University of the Witzwatersrand in Johannesburg to raise money through crowdfunding for a field school expedition into the famous Karoo of South Africa. If this crowdfunding is successful, Doug and I will then be invited to join them on this expedition to film the whole thing for all of you on YouTube to enjoy. There are many more details about all this on the crowdfunding page which will be linked below, as well as the recent videos I've made about the project. 
but this is now your chance to ask us anything you like about Thrinax in the comments below. And before the end of the crowdfunding period, we'll answer as many as we can in a video with Dr. Julian Benoit, the leader of the project. So, ask away. Thank you, Ben. He's right, you know. 